Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Ken Berry with you. I have a very special guest. Jack, you should be honored. You are the very first guest interview on this channel out of all the hundreds and hundreds of, of, of world leading authorities on horticulture, animal husbandry, uh, agronomy. I have chosen you, Jack Spearco, <laughs> founder and creator of The Survival Podcast as my first guest. Well, welcome, Jack. Well, thank you. It is an honor. Anytime I get to talk to you, it's an honor, man. Well, I, I hope I hope you actually meant that and didn't just say it. No. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, what I'm considering to be a, a growing concern, and that is food security, the ability of the average dude, the average chick to, to feed themselves, not only with the meal coming up, but what about tomorrow? What about next month? What about next week? Uh, and, and I think more and more people in modern society are, are becoming quite worried about that. And I think that's a good thing. That's not bad. That's a good thing that people are worried about that. I started listening to you years ago. And back then, I considered myself an amateur gardener, <laughs> right? I wanted to grow some plants. And so I have uh, I've, I've grown lots of plants, but I've also grown as a person. And now I'm not that interested in growing plants. But I think that's the gateway kind of hobby for many, many people. And you are I, I've learned more from you hands down than every other book uh, about gardening, uh, every other book about how to grow this, how to grow that, how to transplant, how to propagate, like literally everything I know about making a plant grow and produce. I've pretty much learn from you. So uh, tell people about you, you kind of your journey, because I, I put in the in the, the comments of this that you basically took a dry, rocky patch of Texas dirt and turned it into a little food oasis. And I've been to Jack's place a couple of times now. And you can tell by looking at the neighbor's yards that it's a chore to get grass to grow there. And so Jack is, is not really interested in grass because he can't eat that. And he didn't have a big enough property to have cattle. So he grows other things. Tell us about yourself, Jack, and what you decided to do with your little rocky patch of Texas dirt. So anyway, I have to say goodbye to my grandkiddos here. Real quick. Oh, there she my is. My granddaughter hey, and my grandson. Going? Good to see you. Hey, man. Good to see uh, you again. Is. Hey, come They're back off. here. What was that purple hair? That was purple hair. Let me see that come purple hair. Purple hair. Oh, wow. I need some of that. That's nice. I love it. I love it. Have fun, guys. We have them here every day because one of the things that's great about working from home, we're able to homeschool our grandkids. But oh, guess uh, what? Jack, guess what? Uh, I signed Beckett up for a Cellus Academy. He's now in kindergarten. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. And I do recommend a Cellus. So goodbye to my wife. Anyway, so I, uh, I grew up gardening and homesteading. Um, I was, I guess, a prepper before they called us preppers uh, back in the 70s and 80s under the toolage of my grandfather uh, in rural Pennsylvania. And so we didn't grow a garden because it was cool. We grew a garden because it helped feed the family. We didn't go hunting and fishing because it was cool. We went hunting and fishing because it helped feed the family. We didn't really care how many horns were on, how many points were on the horns on a buck because you don't eat horns, you eat meat, right? That's right. And so you know, that's my background. And like many people from small town America, I eventually moved to a city, Dallas, Fort Worth area. And uh, I started working on my career and I kind of let all that go for a, a long while. And uh, it was actually, I was actually had moved back to Pennsylvania to take a job as a VP of sales for a company called Fluke Networks. And my, my, I ended up stuck in Pittsburgh on nine 11. And it was kind of a reality check for me. Like, dude, you, you're here. Your wife and your son are scared as hell. You can't get home. You need to do something. Uh, and you need to go back to your roots. So I went home. We built a fire pit and a garden like that week. Like, well, because we, they shut down all travel when we finally got home for a couple of weeks. And I, I mean, it was like, we're going, we're going back to the way things are. And that would have been, you know, obviously 2001. And it wasn't until 08 that I started the survival podcast. I've been doing that ever since it's a daily show five days a week, as you know. And when I started that, I was a damn good gardener and I knew my way around livestock, especially smaller livestock. I, I but like you said, I have smaller pieces of land. So I have to focus on things like quail or ducks or chickens, or geese, 
Um, I probably could pull off sheep here, but then I'd have to worry about fencing a lot of stuff. And my ground's so bad, even like step, step in electric fence ain't happening. I mean, I've got four inches of dirt at best in most of the place. So I, I focused on these smaller animals and I knew how to do that back then, but somebody sent me an, uh, an email when I first started the show. And you know, that's where the best stuff comes from is your followers. And they said, Hey, I want you to see this thing called permaculture. And I'd heard about, it. I thought it was a bunch of hippies rolling around in the mud. And there's videos of permaculture hippies rolling around the mud that will give you confirmation bias on it. <clears throat> but they sent me a video of a dude named Jeff Lawton and it was called greening the desert. And I had been bitching about how tough it is here in North Texas at times, the garden and, and what have you. And, I looked at that and said, I don't have a damn excuse left in the world. If this guy can go to Jordan below sea level in salted earth and grow figs and dates and goats, then I got nothing except I need to learn. And that started my journey in the permaculture. And that started my journey to understanding how to use the, the animals. Cause like you said, I've done amazing things here and a lot of it is vegetative, but without the animals, that just isn't going to happen. So one time we were running like 200 ducks and that's like a quarter cattle unit. And we treated them just like that. We moved them and pulsed them through the land, just like cattle. And that's how we've restored this land. And it's, it's bad this year. We were chatting before you got on air and I've got creeks here that aren't running that no living person has ever seen not run. That's how bad the drought is this year. And I'm not going to say my land's doing good because it's, it's not, nothing does good when you're like this, but all my stuff's alive. And I've got neighbors with 25 year old trees that have never seen a drop of irrigation in their life dying. Yep. And so th that's, that's what we do is we restore landscapes and we do it with natural systems and you can do it anywhere. Uh, there's, you know, obviously you can do more with 10 acres than one and you can do more with one acre than an apartment building, but you can do something for your own food security, no matter where you are. I totally agree. And that I would like to cover all those ranges from somebody living on the 42nd floor in a one bedroom studio apartment with a tiny balcony to somebody who's got a quarter acre backyard to somebody who's got an acre. Uh, and then, you know, when, when you get 10, 20, 30, 40 and above, I mean, it's, you can kind of just trip and fall and you can make some stuff grow because you got all that room, but I really want everybody to understand and make a commitment to themselves and them, their families I'm going to start growing some percentage of my own food, even if it's just 1% of the, of the food I eat in a year, I'm going to start growing that much of my own food. I know where it comes from. I know what, where the seeds came from. I grew it. I made it. I, I trust it. And also I didn't have to go to the store and buy it. I didn't have to waste gas going to the store. Didn't have to stand in line. I didn't have to be the potential victim of a mass shooting while I was at the store. Right. That's increasingly a concern. Uh, you know, I, I didn't catch a virus while I was at the store because I didn't have to leave the house because I grew this myself. So uh, let me first just give you kudos. I've been to Jack's property a couple of times. And, and like I said, from looking at his neighbor's yards, you can tell this is this is not a place where things grow easily. Now, it's definitely not, you know, the, the Jordan Desert. But it, I don't. I mean, there's probably not many places. It is this year. <laughs> it is this year. And so Jack has basically built four inches of soil on top of the rocks that he bought. And so with that four inches of soil, even though he's in the middle of a drought, like he said earlier, his stuff is not dead. It's still alive. And, and many of your neighbors can't say that. When I was at Jack's, I know he had ducks and chickens. I don't know if he had quail then. But no. uh, those are all things that somebody, even with, even if all you've got is a one-car garage, you can raise a significant amount of, of meat and eggs with, with some quail. I've got, yeah. I think, 10 out in the quail hutch with plans to expand that. But every day we get seven or eight quail eggs. And at any given point, I've got 10 quail carcasses. If I wanted to dress them out, that's, that's you know, that's 10 days of food right there for one person. That's a big deal. And that's meaningful. Let's, so let's just start from the smallest okay. one-bedroom studio apartment with a four foot balcony and let's talk about ways they can grow at least 1% of yep. their own food. So let's start out with that. That, 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 you know, I'm not a magician. I can't make uh, a, a one, you know, eight square foot of, of balcony produce enough food for somebody to eat. I, I, we, we've talked about things like throwing quail in, into bird cages and you can do that. But since you raise quail, you know, the one thing about quail is they poop a lot. Now that's 
that's fertility and that's great, but we need lots of carbon for that. So I would really advise people to use proper caging that has a slide out shelf and use wood chips. And then in that apartment situation, I would have a worm bin out on that patio. And because you're going to need to dump those wood chips at least every other day. Uh, or you're not going to like the smell of your home. But those worms are going to turn that, like it'll disappear in minutes. And now we've got a compost that we can use. We probably can't even use it all in a small space like that. Yep. So we can give it to our friends that have land and then maybe they'll give us some of their food. So we can start growing food offsite by exporting our fertility because just that alone is better fertility than they can buy at any store. Oh, because absolutely. you know what you're feeding your quail you're giving them worm castings and worm composted uh, quail, and you're going to be able to get uh, you know, what they call worm tea, which is the juice out of that thing. And I can't really, as much time as we have tonight, go on exactly how to do all that. But so that would be one thing you could do. I would do some container gardening out on that patio. And people that live in the type of apartment you're talking about usually busy as hell. So I would do that container gardening with what's called a wicking bed. And again, I can't give all the parameters, but basically we have water at the bottom. And then we have a layer of weed fabric and then we have a soil mixture above that. And that way we can fill up that wicking bed once a week and we don't have to water it. If we, if we every Saturday morning we get up, have our coffee on our day off, go out there, fill up our wicking beds and we're good to go. And then, you know, your audience is, you know, like I am, we're very keto or carnivore centric. So when it comes to what we're growing, the good news is the easiest thing to grow in large volume with high nutrient density and small space that's not an animal is greens, right? And you don't need a lot of sun. So even if you don't have a great solar aspect, we can start planting lettuces uh, and, and other greens like spinach and, and coriander and things like that, that will do well in our cool weather. And in our warmer weather, we can move to things like Swiss chard. Uh, we can use to, uh, New Zealand spinach, different plants like that and, and grow a lot of greens. And you should be able to come up with at least a side dish and a salad every week just from that. We could go even further. We could take something like a 100-gallon Rubbermaid stock tank, put that out there, fill that sucker up with water, put a simple, what's called a sponge filter. You can Google it. The best ones I know of come from a place called Aquarium Co-op and one little air pump in it. We're not going to grow a bunch of fish to eat in there. It's just not enough space. We could try it, but I'm going to tell you, unless you live in a place where you don't have, where you don't have to uh, worry about winter freezes, tilapia, you might be able to grow 20 tilapia in there. It's probably not worth it. Throw some minnows in there, some mosquito fish, keep the mosquitoes down. Put some cinder blocks in it. Now make a permanent wicking bed. So all we're going to do now is take some flower pots and set them on top of the, the, the uh, flower pot, uh, flower pots, set them on top of the cinder blocks. We want the water to come up about 50%. And we just fill those with a good soil mixture. And let's plant some aquatic plants in there. Oh. Uh, like Ipomera aquatica, which is, uh, it's also known as uh, Chinese water spinach. Vietnamese yep. water, spinach, Kang Kong, sort of a million names. It's illegal in a lot of the country in the South because it's supposed to be invasive, but that ships that, that cow's left the barn anyway. I don't think it's going to be roping down to your patio to get you through it. And it's a relative of the uh, sweet potato family. But unlike sweet potatoes where you can eat the tuber and the leaves, this thing has no tuber and you can eat the leaves and the stem, and it's freaking delicious. So now you've got a green. And the reason I recommend that particular plant grown that way is it is ridiculously aggressively growing. You you will you will probably be feeding some of it to your quail if you're growing quail. Mm -hmm. We could throw a few frogs out there, put a little entry point into it, and you know I've I've lived in apartments and I've had lizards hanging out. Well, if you got water, shade, and sun, the lizards are all going to live in your property. And I mean that's that's the kind of thing you can do with an apartment. And you know if you're on the north facing side of the apartment and you get no sun, that might not really be as doable, but if you get a little bit of sun, you don't need much for greens. Or we could also move into the world of like hydroponics and do that indoors. Take yourself like a wire rack. I think you've seen mine. I, I built an indoor uh, vertical farm, couple uh, grow trays, Rubbermaid tub full of hydroponics fertilizer in the bottom, have a pump that goes off 15 minutes every hour. So a little $8 pump, put down one tab every hour, goes off. Floods the trays, shuts off, trays drain, and grow greens. Again, don't try to grow. People that want to, like, talk, I want to grow peppers and tomatoes. That'll be the most expensive tomato you ever ate in your life. Right. Go, go to the farmer's market and buy a locally produced tomato. Grow all your greens and grow greens for your salads and, and stuff like that or, like, accoutrements from your eating or and grow greens to, to uh, 
to, to like saute and whatever with your steak. Cause that's pretty much what I eat is steak, chicken, goose, duck, pork, and greens. That's 90% of what I eat. Yep. And I, I love those ideas. And I would challenge everybody listening to this either live or in the future. <clears throat> if you in, are in a, an apartment situation and you have a cockatiel or parakeets or God forbid a parrot, sell that thing. Okay. <laughs> put up, put up a, an eight by 10 at the pet store used cockatiel for sale says, you know, uh, yes, sir, daddy, and whatever, and whistles, uh, the wolf whistle, sell that and use that money to buy three or four coternix quail. Put them in the parakeet cage. Now you've got two or three coternix quail eggs every day for, for a year or two, right? And a lot of people are like, I don't want to put quail in cages. Coternix quail have been in captivity for over a thousand years. Yeah. They literally, if you let them out of the cage, they will go. They get don't live in the cage. wild. There's no well, place they, you can they, go they see a last, wild Courtney's quail. It doesn't exist. They would last five minutes on my farm if they got out of their, their cage. They want to be in the cage. That's how they've lived for a thousand years. The Chinese have, have husbanded them for thousands of years. So get those. And then in a pinch, you've got three or four quail you can dress down and eat. If you have an aquarium, get rid of those pretty little fish that cost so much money. They keep dying if you look at them funny and get some tilapia. If nothing else, get some guppies. They're cheap. They reproduce like crazy. And guess what? You can deep fry a guppy and eat the entire thing. 100%. Right? So here's another to way to, to handle your, uh, your your fish tanks, right? So turn your fish tanks into profit centers using them to buy food. So, for instance, I have, a, I have a wall of tanks behind me here. And in a lot of them, I grow a little shrimp called neocardania. Uh, and it takes a little bit of work and some aggressive culling. I have tons of them in my outdoor systems where they're not supposed to live. Turns out if you put enough of them out there, the ones that can handle the winter do live and they reproduce. But the ones that I grow indoors, I cherry pick them. And I want the darkest red ones, the deepest blue ones. And you can sell a dozen of those things on eBay for like 200 bucks. So how many of those do you have to sell to fill your freezer? Not that many. And it, it does take some work. And I don't do it that much anymore because I did it to see if I could do it. And like, I'm a full-time podcaster. I make more money podcasts than I'm going to make selling shrimp. But if that's not you, then you could be doing that. The other thing I could be doing, I have a 40, a beautiful 40 gallon tank uh, with just some really gorgeous fish in it. But the money in it, the money in it that can be sold is the, the plants. So I have plants in there that I could pull basically pups off the plants and I could sell those plants $10 pop. Right. And if I market the fact my all well, my tanks are what you call low tech tanks. So that means I don't pump CO2 into them. So a lot of people that do low tech tanks, they want to buy plants from other people that do, because when you take a plant and drop it in a low tech tank without that CO2 injection, it'll usually melt and maybe it'll come back. But if it came from one and it's adapted to it, that's not going to happen. So like that's the other thing. When you're in a really small space, start looking around and asking yourself, what can I do to produce money here? with horticulture or animal husbandry so that I can use that money. So if you're making enough money to buy five pounds of meat a week, it's like growing five pounds of meat a week. You grow yes. what you can grow. I have my big, my bigger outdoor ponds. You know, these are four or 5,000 gallon ponds that I've built because I can't go in the ground. I build them above grade and I have a koi out there. If I needed money, that koi is a $300 fish. It's a platinum koi about 34 inches long. And the only reason I still have them is because I like him. But if I needed if I needed money more and I liked him, he would go to a yuppie in, in downtown Fort Worth right now. So start thinking that way, too. Yes, absolutely. And in order for that to really work and be sustainable, we all need to be encouraging our local farms, our local gardeners, our local ranchers, our local little old uh, ladies and gentlemen who have, you know, 5, 10, 15 hens in the backyard Yep. They, we need to not only encourage them with our words, like, thank you so much for doing this. I love it that I've got a neighbor with chickens, but also we need to encourage them with our dollars as well. Yes. Because when you, when you buy their eggs and when you buy their local, locally grown produce and, and meat, at some point when enough neighbors are doing that, they're going to say, Jack, you know what? 
I really ought to, I'm making a good little amount of money here. I probably need to increase the size of my operation. Yep. And all, now all of a sudden they're moving up in scale and they can knock the price down a little bit because of volume, right? And yep. so, yeah, I, I love the, the idea of making money and then using that to buy local food. That's yes, absolutely. I know one of the first one of the things I learned from you was was purse lane. And uh -huh. I have got I have got purse lane, Jack. I buy purse lane seeds by the pound and I do your random walk and scatter method. I just literally I probably sowed three pounds of purse lane all over this farm. And so I'll be out moving the sheep from one paddock to the other. And I'll look down like, oh, there's a there's some purse lane. I yeah. could literally eat that right now if I wanted yep. to. And it's yeah. it's it's fairly high in oxalates. Uh, that bothers some people. Some people it doesn't, but it's also a great source of vitamin C and all kinds of vitamins and minerals. And it's literally grows like a weed. I've got a, a pile of rock out here where they're working in the yard, and there's a big fat purslane plant growing right on top of this just rocky junky chert. And so uh, Jack has a podcast called The Sur Survival Podcast. I got a link in the show notes, and he's got over what three thousand episodes. Yeah, we did 31, 33 today, I think. Every episode is is got tidbits of wisdom, just like we're doing right now. How, what are the easiest plants to grow indoors? What, how can I use my fish tank? Just on and on and on. And I've learned so much from him. So let's let's scale up now, Jack. Before let's we talk, do, let's talk about quail real quick because oh, that'll, yeah, fit, sure. yeah, that'll yeah. fit anywhere. It's one of the best things a person can do for food security. You you got to buy your feed in. I haven't cracked. I can do it with chickens with a restaurant waste stream or something like that. But quail, you got to buy your feed in, but it's cheap. That's Go right. buy 300 pounds and you're good for a year with yes. a big operation, right? Yeah. Now let me, let's scale up. Now we're talking about a family of two with a, with yep. a kid. Yep. They've got a two bedroom house and they have okay. a one car garage, Jack. And we'll they, quail and there. this is one of those tall and skinnies like they love to build in Nashville, Tennessee. So yep. it's a quarter, quarter acre lot and they've got a one car garage. Now let's talk about what they could do uh, to utilize okay. that garage and that little tiny backyard. So let's take the garage. I know a person in Detroit, uh, Michigan. He has a one car garage. He's got a four foot wide by two foot footprint of his quail stack. And in that quail stack, he does about 1,200 coal birds a year. 1,200 birds a year. 1,200 birds. That's how many he puts in the freezer or gives to his neighbors so they don't complain because the male quail do make kind of an annoying rooster sound. If you're not breeding, you don't care. You just you wait till they crow and you pop the head off them. If they're the brown variety, you can tell by their breast what they are. Um, but the reason they're so amazing is they will go from a little bitty thing about the size of a golf ball out of the egg. And I think they're 18 days on their egg cycle. So if you incubate them 18 days, you got a little golf ball. Yep. At six weeks of age, you've got a bird that's ready to harvest for meat. Yep. Okay. At seven weeks, it starts popping eggs out if it's a female, and it starts breeding at six weeks if it's a male. That's right. And your, your ratio in your cage it needs to be about one rooster to about four hens. If you do much more than that, the damn hens will kill the rooster. So don't do yep. that to the poor guy, yep. right? Yep. Yep. But you could have one hen and four, four roosters at any given time that are your production. And since those hens will give you an egg a day, right? And you, let's say you want to do two dozen at a time. So every three days, you got a dozen. So every six days, you've got two dozen eggs going to incubator. All you do is put them on the counter. Don't, don't put them in the incubator. Don't do anything special. They won't start to gestate until they go in the incubator. They'll all hatch within hours of each other if you do that. You yep. got two dozen birds coming out. Every four days, you get you can you can incubate more. You have your stacks to grow out, the ones you want for me. And then you have all that compost we talked about, worm bin, or now you've got more space. So now we could be doing a more traditional composting method. So now we've got meat security like through the roof. Like through the roof, we haven't had to worry about the blue hairs won't let us have chickens. Nobody needs to see inside your garage. Right. They they live in, in Brad's garage in Detroit through their winters. That's a hell of a lot colder than most of the country, so they can handle that. Um, down here, you might need a fan in there for the heat, you know. But, okay, you're good. You've got – and then – so the problem with raising livestock for a lot of people is when it's time for it to graduate into the belly, like it's a hard thing to process. Yeah, I can literally show you how to process a quail with no tools in 30 seconds. Yeah, it's super quick. I haven't head done comes it yet, off, but I've watched some videos. Yeah, head comes off, breast comes out, leg quarters come out, snap feet off, 
Now, when you're doing your cold birds, now your cold birds are your older hens. When you're like, I need a new group. So those I'll use shears on because they get a little tougher when you want to pull the legs out. But you end up with a boneless, skinless breast and the boneless, skinless leg quarters. I like skin. It's good, but it's it's so quick that fried and bacon grease yeah. your fat, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So now we got that. Now we're going to go out in the backyard. Well, now yes. we're going to say, what do you want to do? Because one of the things you could be doing, if you don't have blue hairs that are going to complain about the quail, you could actually have that small little group of quail in the in, inside. You have a little brooder down the bottom, and that's where you put your little baby puff balls. Well, as soon as they're big enough to go outside, as soon as they got feathers on them, you could be tractoring them in basically a big cage, and you don't want an open bottom with quail, right? Because everything needs to quail. If they turn the cage over, it's going to get them. So what you have is like bigger holes in the bottom so the quail can peck through. Now we can tractor your quail that you're growing out through your backyard. If you have a garden, we can put in a few beds and we can tractor them right through the garden. So we tractor them through this bed and then we move them to the next bed. Now we plant this bed. Now the quail have worked it. They've, they've fertilized it. They're helping to remineralize it. Now you're producing for your meat. You're producing a better product. Yep. And when your quail that are in the garage are ready to be cold, don't cull them immediately. Grow out your next group. So you got young birds. So they're going to go into a molt at 18 months. That's going to shed their feathers, going to stop laying eggs. And when they come back after that, they'll never lay as good as they did their first cycle. Right. So then put them out in the tractor, finish them out there, clean them out. So they're not relying so much on that feed you're buying in. They're actually getting that. Now we got better quality meat. We just play with quail. We haven't even started with the rest of that quarter of an acre yep. yet. Yep. And so if you've got a, a nice security fence in the backyard, you know, the, the eight foot wood fence. Yeah. So the, the blue hairs, as Jack says, can't can't see what you got back there. I have to say this, Jack, because every time I, I, I start talking about chickens, someone says, well, I mean, they're going to crow and the neighbors will hear them. No. Number one, you don't want to have roosters if you have an HOA or if you have yeah, yeah. zoning. Hens, number one, do not crow. Number two, hens will lay eggs if there's no rooster present. Yes, they will. A lot of people do not know that because they're so disconnected from the earth and from the farm. They don't realize that. Hens are going to lay eggs without a rooster. So you can absolutely have a flock of hens in your backyard if you've got a high wooden fence. And, and you don't have a bobcat problem like we had in Nashville. Yeah. So let's talk about that, too, because we, I free range my birds. You've been here, so you know. But that's because I live on three acres and I can. And if one goes over the fence to the neighbors, the neighbors don't care. Uh, if I lived in a suburban area and I wanted chickens, I would probably do an old style victory garden. I'd have my chicken coop and I would have two runs and I would garden in one run and put the chickens in the other run. And in my climate, instead of doing it every year back and forth, it's I have a two crop climate. I have a spring summer climate and a fall winter climate. Right. So what I would do is I would run those birds on one side, deep litter mulch so that's throwing every bit of carbon and, and other junk i can get every bit of my yard waste goes in there and they would they would work that ground for me and, and when you have a setup like that jack there is literally no such thing as kitchen waste no there's, there's no such thing so all of a sudden you pull out the crisper drawer and there's yep. three big fat zucchini you bought two months ago and you're like oh shit i forgot these zucchini guess what that's fine because you're going to turn those zucchini into eggs yep Yep. So you feed that to them. And the other side, right, if I actually have a separate garden, I might even go ahead and when I move them out of there, I'll throw in a crop of, depending on the time of year, what it's going to be. But if it's, let's say it's early, early spring and it's warm enough, I'll throw a crop in there like buckwheat and cowpea. And I'll let that come up and I'll move them right back in there just for a week and let them take it down and then put them back in the other side for the long cycle. Now I have really turbocharged. Now I'm going to plant my garden for my food in there. And yes. I'm just going to keep doing that rotation. And I've got plenty of eggs. Now there is an actual way to keep roosters from crowing. I don't like it, but it does work. And if you needed to under hard times, you could do it. And what you do is you take basically the, uh, the Velcro style uh, tie wrap. You put it around the rooster's neck. Now you don't choke him. You put it around him to where it'll stay there, but it's, it, it, it's not going to do him any harm. But when he goes to crow, he'll choke himself because I've never his, heard that his neck That's will expand. Don't do it with the damn vinyl freaking ones or whatever. And I oh, wouldn't even, I wouldn't zip tie, this, right? Yeah, I wouldn't even do this to a bird myself. But if we got into a point where like I either need to be able to have a fertile flock 
or I'm going to be starving. Okay, then the rooster can wear a collar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that would be one way that you could handle that. Um, I would just stay away from roosters in the suburbs unless you live in a place where other people do it and it's cool. Like if Absolutely. people are okay with it. Around here, if you bitch about somebody's chicken, like 20 people are going to beat you up because like you just aren't allowed to even talk about it. Like you ain't from around here. We don't want you here. You need to go home, Yankee. That's exactly. that's what exactly. you're going to get around here if you complain about a chicken. Yep. One but of the two miles things. down the road, but to be fair, it's not just where I live. It's two miles down the road. It's Blue Hair City and there ain't no chickens down there. You know? Right, right. One of the biggest things, I'm on Twitter a lot, and one of the biggest things that the, the, the people who love Earth and want to save Earth – one of the main things they bitch about is food waste. And yep. I agree, we shouldn't waste any food whatsoever. But if, if you're living in the in the you know the suburban usual way, what are you gonna do with your kitchen waste if you don't have quail, which can eat kitchen waste? Yep. If you don't have chickens, you're gonna have to put it down the food disposal. It's gonna go yep. to the sewer, or you're gonna put it in a garbage bag and it's gonna go to the, the landfill. Chickens allow you to take better care of the earth. Because not only are you saving money, you're literally turning spoiled produce into eggs. I mean, that it's magic, right? And yeah. so you're you're decreasing your landfill footprint, you're decreasing your, your sewage plant footprint, and you're creating eggs in your backyard. I mean, that's kind of magical, right? Yeah, it is. And let's let's move on to another animal that would be really easy to keep and produces a ton of uh of meat. I mean, literally, you can produce more meat with these than you can with, this, like, say, one goat and one, one or two goats and, and one buck. And that would be like three doe rabbits and one buck rabbit. Yes. And if I was living in the suburbs and I needed to worry about meat, that's what I would be growing. And if the blue hairs get involved, well, these are my pet rabbits. Now go away. Right. Right. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna go out in that beautiful big backyard that probably has pop up irrigation in it and it's green all year. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a whole bunch of seed like Dutch white clover and New Zealand white clover and some different perennial grass mixes and some different herbs and forbs. And I'm going to spread that. And my whole my whole you know yard is going to turn into a meadow. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to get the cheapest non-mulching bagging lawnmower I can get. And I'm going to feed my rabbits in their hutches if I'm not tractor and bunnies, because that's a little complicated. You can do it, but it's a little complicated. I'm going to feed them mostly from there. I'm always going to have pellets available, but they're going to have very low pellet utilization. Then I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to type in a uh, homemade mini baler. And I'm going to learn how to make for about 50 bucks, a little baler. I'm going to make little bales out of my grass. I'm going to make hay while the sun shines. Yes. I'm going to store that in my little garage in suburban city. And I'm going to have feed for my rabbits all year long. Then I'm going to take the Nick Ferguson approach and say, well, we're going to have some trees here. And instead of planting freaking Bradford pears that don't produce nothing, maybe I don't want to grow a bunch of fruit. Maybe I've gone keto. Maybe Ken saved my life, right? And and I lost 100 pounds. Maybe that happened. So maybe I'm going to plant some hybrid willows and some poplar and uh, some white mulberry. And then I'm going to start taking that. I'm going to feed that as fodder to my rabbits. So now I've got, uh, like, uh, with rabbits in that scenario, I almost don't need any feed, but I'm going to have it just to make sure that that need is met. You know, a couple little bells of Timothy hay and some rabbit pellets, and, and that's your extra security blanket there. So, that, that, I mean, that's just – and the, here's something that people need to understand. These small suburban lots, quarter acre, half acre, in some ways they're an incredible advantage. I can't irrigate all three acres of my land. I have one well – I, I can't do it. If you live on a lot like that, you can irrigate every inch of it and you can do intensive management to every square foot. And yes. you, you, people will say, well, if you have four acres, five acres, you could pick a small zone one and do the same thing. You can, but it takes a lot more discipline. Yeah. The land form itself disciplines you, right? Yeah. When yeah. I lived in Arkansas, you could, I had five but acres. you probably won't. Exactly. When I lived in Arkansas, I had five acres, but most of it was like a cliff. Yeah. So I had about a third of an acre I could really, and it was beautiful because I always was looking at it. I was always taking care of it. So some of the most productive systems per square foot I've seen are on one-tenth to half acre suburban lots, especially if that lot is good orientation and most of the space is in the backyard. My place in Arlington I used to have, it was like a third of an acre, but the front, the front piece was a postage stamp, and all that land was in the back. We produced so much food there, and it wasn't even hard. 
and it, yeah. you, it's easy to automate. And if you're going to have gardens, you're going to have trees, put irrigation in, automate it. Yes. Because I want when I, whenever you think the word automate, I want you to think this. What would you do if you didn't have to do it? What would you? And the answer is, I will. I would do everything if I didn't have to do it. Well, with with automation, you have to do it once. Yes. And then it takes care of itself. There's no dude out on a golf course with a garden hose spraying right. the greens. Right? They put automated irrigation in because they One want time. they want to sell membership to yuppies that come out there and spend a lot of money hit a ball around. You put your garden in, put irrigation in, drip. Spray. I don't care what you do, but you automate it. And if you, even if you want to go low tech, get those little orbit mechanical timers where you go out and you say, well, it needs to be water for 15 minutes. You dial it to 15 minutes, you walk away. You don't forget about it because it's, it's easy to do. And then that happens every day while you're focusing your attention on something else. If Correct. somebody, if somebody in this theoretical one car garage, two bedroom house with a quarter acre backyard with a good fence, if they went whole hog, Jack, with just fill their garage up with stacks of quail cages and fill their backyard up, had, had elevated rabbit cages all the way around, had hens underneath, how many neighbors could you feed if you just went full bores and, and just saturated as much as you could? How many people could you feed with that, that system? Probably at least a dozen families, at least. At least a dozen families on your dozen families. Right you're going to be bringing food in if you're going that heavy, right? Like like feed stock. But sure. if you look at the DeVeas family, and I think I think Jules passed away a couple of years ago. They're not my favorite people, but I do love what they're doing. And yes. they were growing somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,500 pounds of produce on a tenth of an acre in Southern California. Yep, I've seen on their videos. Pepper. And it's all they, they're not doing animals like we're talking about. They're doing... Right. I think they had a couple of chickens, but that's not real. There, there. That was all mostly salad greens, tomatoes, and peppers. Yep. Is what they were yep. doing. Yep. And so I'm like, I'm a lot like Jack, and I have great respect for Jack because of this this aspect of his personality. I have I have watched the crunchiest hippie tree huggers and how they grow their produce, and and this family he's talking about. That's kind of their style, which is totally fine. I have watched and read books by the hardcore of preppers and survivalists. How do they store food? How do, what do they do to protect their family? And I think, I, I think that we need to all take our blinders off and we need to go, okay, you know, this guy, he may be the most liberal Democrat or the most conservative Republican and whatever your political leanings is, I don't really care. But what I'm saying is, is you got to put that, you got to put that kind of stupid shit away we're getting to the point in our society where food's going to actually start to really matter and where it comes yeah. from. And if it comes, is really going to start to matter. So all you guys watching this, you got to start branching out and say, okay, I don't care what their politics are. I don't care what the religion is. They do it better than anybody else. I mean, growing 7,500 pounds of food on what I don't, I forget what size they're it's a tenth of an acre, but that includes the footprint of, an acre. of the house. And like the, like that's not the total amount of dirt. Yeah, so I, need, I, I would I need say they were more like a twentieth of an acre of grow space. Yeah, I need you all, you guys, to take your politics and your religion and your preconceived notions and stick them up your butt and shut the hell up about all that shit. And let's talk about who grows the most produce on the smallest footprint. Who yeah. grows the most sheep in the smallest pasture? Who grows the most chickens? The most quail? You need to be figuring out how to do that because that's going to be very important here in the near future. I dig this comment, Ken. Let's talk about these guys for a minute for food production. All right. Let's talk about um, right here. You keep changing it on me. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, who, I think this uh, one here is Muscovies, though. Muscovies. Yeah. They're like the goose duck. They're like half goose, half duck. Okay. So, what we're talking about is baby beef. That's what a Muscovy duck is. The, the breast of Muscovy tastes like the best, not a veal. But not quite a full grow out, like the best young steer you had. Like he was too young, but you were hungry and he was there, and that's what you had. That's what they taste like. They have almost no fat in the meat. They have beautiful fat in the skin. It's gorgeous fat. But there's more than one form of automation. There's automation that's a technological automation, which is I take it and I set the timers and set the adreno or whatever. But there's natural automation. In other words, nature does the work for me. So I don't have to do it. So to me, that's automation. There's yes. one thing you're going to have to do with scubby ducks, especially in a suburban environment. Once a year, they're going to molt, they're going to shed all their feathers, and they're going to grow their feathers back, and a muscovy flies. And when I say they fly, I mean they fly away. 
they go where they want to go. I had to, I let them get out one year and they were on my pergola pooping in my pool, right? And swimming <laughs> in my pool. So you got to, you got to catch them at the molt and clip those wings so they can't fly. But now you got a perfect suburban bird. They don't make any noise. They make like a <sighs> sound. Right. And the, the girls make a little pee pee sound. Uh, like peep, peep. It's kind of cute. Um, one drake, four or five girls will produce you a ton of eggs and they will produce you a ton of babies. And they are, a, they are basically a wild bird that has allowed us to keep them. They're not really domesticated. So when you look at all the other duck people keep, they're basically mallards and we've bred them to change their color, their size, their shape. The Muscovy, if you go into Central America where they're from and you see wild Muscovies that look exactly like the cankled, ugly little guys that we keep. The males are huge. The girls will go broody. They will take care of their babies. And in a little backyard, if you have bushes and stuff, one will just display, like, I must have lost her. No, nope. she's got a nest. She'll go in there. She'll come walking back out. She'll have 18 to 24 babies with her. And in six to eight months, every one of those is excellent table fare. It's some of the best eating you'll ever have. And the drakes are huge. And if you can solve the food issue so that you're not paying a lot of money to feed them, it's free. Because you didn't do anything. You got to give them water and you got to give them food. And they are amazing grazers. They love grass. They love forbs. They love things like that. They're much less expensive to feed than convent. I'm not saying no feed. I'm saying less feed. And if you can tie into a restaurant waste stream, they're free. They're yeah. free. You go down I'm to I'm about to look pool. into that right now. I'm about to scale up my chicken production and I'm going to be talking to a couple of local restaurants. Be like, hey, if I bring you a 55 gallon drum once a day, well, you just throw all your food. Throw it in there, and then you ain't got to pay the dumpster. I don't people, care what right? it is. Throw it all in there. So and I just did a show on this yesterday with Billy Bond, and what he said is never tell them, never tell them you're feeding it to your livestock. You tell them I want this waste to make compost with. Ah, uh, now which is not a lie. It is what you're going to do. The animals are just your labor force. That's right, because they're going to turn it into poop eventually, anyway. Yep. Yeah, so why, why, why? Tell us why, Jack. Why would you not so, say this is for my livestock? Liability issues. So if it's livestock feed, it could contaminate the livestock, and somebody could die, and somebody could get sued, and it's all BS, but that's how they think. But if you say it's compost, and especially if they're one of these ESG companies, man, you guys are contributing carbon to the waste stream, bro, and I'm here to help you. Like, that's right. I'm here to take, like, I, I, and uh, what Billy said is if you go to a school, like a middle school or something like that, and they tell you no, turn up at their next school board meeting and say, I have agreed to take all of this milk, all of this vegetation, all this waste that you that, that, that these people out here are paying for and do something good with it. And instead of it going to the garbage and having to pay a waste disposal fee on it. And they said no. And I don't think that makes a lot of sense. He said some other stuff that I'll let him speak for himself with. It was pretty comical. But you guys can look that episode up. That was uh, 3132 at the survival podcast dot com. Yeah, so this is the kind of stuff that Jack has got a podcast. If you're like, well, I wonder about quail. He's got podcasts. I wonder about rabbits. He's got podcasts. I think you've got quail? a YouTube video about I got the rabbit, don't you? Yeah, well, on quail, when I got into quail, I did a series of shows on quail. I did an episode of Q&A on quail. The episode of Q&A was three hours and 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Just on so Q&A. if you're new to this and you're like, I need to learn how to do some of this stuff, Jack Spearco's your guy. He's got YouTube videos. Right. He's got a... 3,000 episode plus podcasts that he, he just breaks some of this down. He's got special guests all the time. Uh, you got to, got to click on the link down in the show notes and make sure that you bookmark that. Um, I don't know if there's many of your episodes of the survival podcast. I haven't listened to, I've been listening to Jack Spearco since he was in the Jetta and some of you guys will know what that means. Uh, yeah. So Jack is in his car going to work and he started his podcast mobily. And so yeah. about every 10th episode, he's in the middle of explaining something. All of a sudden, you hear Jack go batshit crazy, start cussing and throwing stuff because somebody's <laughs> cut him off in traffic. And it's just the coolest thing ever. I freaking yeah. love that. I'm like, because I thought you were make, faking it there for a few episodes. No. Until There's I heard that, I'm like, I think he's really in the car. <laughs> There's an episode where I dropped the F-bomb because I thought I was going to get T-boned. And you hear the car light up the brakes behind me and all. I had nowhere I could go. It was one of those like hemmed in. But the one dude moved and the other dude moved. And then the guy next to me got T-boned. And 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it was something else. But I've learned so much from this man. So you guys are honored to, to listen to him and listen to his podcast episodes. So now I think we've covered – now let's scale up. Now we've got right. somebody with a two-car garage. They've got a 100-gallon fish tank because, you know, somebody's got a job in the family. They've got a they've got a two-acre backyard. Oh, wow. And yeah, I mean, they got plenty of room. So let's talk about what a, fa- what a family like that could do, how they could get started. I mean, let's start off with everything we said about the smaller suburban property would be the way to go. Let's look at this from a standpoint of we have a big enough property now to start actually managing in true zones. So in permaculture, we do zone management and zone zero would be the house. It's inside where you live. Zone one would be a place that you step foot on every day. And that's the place you're always going to be. It's in your, your line of sight. You're going to be there. If you have a little chicken coop and it doesn't, and everybody teaches it in circles, I think that's stupid because people don't walk in circles, right? So if you walk out to the chicken coop every day, let the chickens out, that little peninsula, all even if you have that coop way out by the fence, that whole peninsula is zone one. So maybe we would put some gardens in in that peninsula on both sides of that path because you're walking every, that way anyway. Every single you're day, you go there, right? So we're gonna go out there. We're gonna go out there with a bucket. The bucket's got all the compostables for the chickens to eat off the counter. On the way out, oh, there's the weed in the garden. We're going to pick the weed up, throw it in the bucket. There's a weed in the garden, but it's pretty little, and chickens like that weed. I'm going to let that grow a little bit longer. We're going to get out there. We're going to dump the bucket. So we're going to start managing zones because two acres, there's going to be some places on it that you don't step every day, you know, unless it's just a thing that you do. So you start thinking like your little orchard type arrangements and all kind of go in your zone two or three in that thing. We're not going to go to a full five zone system, like for managing a large farm where we've got a food forest and stuff like that. Even if we have a food forest on two acres, it's probably going to be handled more like a zone three, meaning heavy mulches, probably some irrigation in the right climates and what have you. But we're going to do what we've done already. And if we're smart, we have that discipline. We're going to put those intensive gardens and the livestock that need attention every day as close to the prop, the, the, the house as we can. We're going to start looking at things like how can we cut our, our, our electric bill. So if we have a south facing porch, maybe we put a pergola over it instead of a full cover and we plant some sort of vining crop on it. That's going to shade that, keep the house cooler during our summers, but all those leaves are going to fall off and open up and we're going to let that sun come in in the winter. So then instead of planting something up there, like some sort of Ivy or something like that, maybe we should plant something edible, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's grapes. It'd be yeah. kind of cool if we were walking out on our back porch and we were able to just reach up and pull grapes off it or passion yeah. fruit or something like that. Yeah, you could also yeah. plant gourds or squash. They would climb gourds. and cover the entire thing. They have humongous leaves. Yep. And then you yep. literally would have gourds or or, or squash hanging down uh, as decor on your front porch. You would have a basically a covered porch because the leaves cover it. Yep. And this brings up something. I love to think about things in layers. Yep. Because Jack's, first of all, we're talking about growing food, right? You've got winter squash, summer squash, whatever you've decided to grow up your trellis and cover that pergola over your front porch. But you're also, those leaves are going to turn into mulch. Keep talking. And I'm going to grab some. You, yeah. And also, you just lowered your electric bill because now that part of your house is shaded from the summer sun. But then when the winter comes, those plants are going to die. Then you're going to be able to get winter sun hitting your house. And that's going to save you money in the winter. So you literally are making your house more solar friendly. So saving money on the electric, both in summer and winter, you're making mulch to build soil and you've got all these winter squash or summer squash or whatever. Look at this thing. What if you (laughs) have those hanging down on your front porch and you could just walk out the door and pick one? What is that? This is called Trombuccino zucchini. And it's basically a summer squash or a winter squash, depending on how long you let it grow. This one grew long enough that it's, it's a winter squash. And what makes this so awesome is many people out there think that the worst evil thing on the planet is a squash vine borer, and they're not wrong. It's a horrible insect pest with squash. It gets in the vine. Vine looks beautiful, also the vine dies. These are very, very resistant because the vines are tough and small, and they grow like crazy. If you pick it young in green, it's like a regular zucchini. And this neck from here up, that's all meat. There's no seeds in it. Nice. So if I cut that off, this right here, if you're keto and you want to make zucchini noodles, yeah, the whole thing is a screenshot of this right now. 
for for future use. No, back out like you had it before. Yeah, just never mind like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this like that. <laughs> so th this whole thing, right, is going to make zucchini noodles for you. Is edible. If you, if you let it grow out like this, then it's basically a equivalent to a butternut. So we're going to make a bunch of butternut squash soup with it for the workshop this fall. Yeah. And um, if you're a carnivore, you can chop that puppy up and feed it to your chickens I was and turn it into eggs. So there's a ton of seeds in here. So there's your seed crop for next year. But I've got like, I think I got like 15 of these sitting on the counter out there from what? one vine, from one vine in a bad growing year. If you live in New Jersey and you plant these things, you're going to be throwing them over the fence at people because they're <laughs> going to grow like that. And you're they may be trying to give them away. Yeah, seriously. And, and yeah. they're, they're just fantastic. And it's an example of you learn as you go. Like that's a plant that I didn't know about six years ago. I found it about six years ago and I'd given up on growing squash in this climate because the vine boards just made it miserable. You could put netting on it. And I'm like, I, I'd rather eat meat anyway. And when I found those, I'm like, well, I'll give it a try. Yeah. And I mean, if you have a spiralizer or something, you throw that neck in it and you're good. Or if you want to do, they'll get that big and still be zucchini like before they'll start to, to harden. Yeah. Uh, they'll get about that big and then they'll start to turn. I grew one last year that was three times that size. But so if yeah. you have a food processor, you take that neck and you put it in a food processor and you cut it in little discs and go make you some keto lasagna with it. Absolutely. Right. I mean, there's like, you Absolutely. you learn as you go, bro. I mean, that's that's I'm learning every day. There's there's nobody that knows everything about this stuff. You know, we uh, one of the people I learned a lot about soil from is a is a woman named Elaine Ingham. She's an amazing uh, woman. Her husband is a nematologist. The nematode is a little thing that lives in the soil. There are people that they don't study, but nothing but that one organism. I didn't know right. that was a thing, right? He's got and a PhD so, in nematology. Nematology, like so there, and there's no way that I had a guy on a couple of weeks ago that talked about Korean uh, in IMO farming, indigenous microorganism, and how you take like some rice and some other stuff and you put it in a box and you set it under a tree and then you you basically capture the indigenous microorganisms and you spray that on a plant that's sick and the plant gets better, the disease goes yes. away. Yes, right. Absolutely. And so I'm learning about that for the first time. And I've been doing this since I was seven years old. Yeah. And that's what's beautiful about this is you never get bored. You never stop learning. Oh, I totally agree. And I want everybody to get over your freshman nerves. You're like, oh, my God, I've never had a garden. I've never had chickens. Literally, these are the most forgiving things that you'll ever do. Unless you're just egregiously stupid, you're you're not going to mess this up. You're going to have some degree of success. Give it fertility and water. And as years go on, your success rate's going to climb, and you're yeah. going to become more and more of an expert at this. And you may start out with a black thumb like Nisha did, but after a few years, that that thumb is going to be fluorescent green. You're going to you're going to be great at this. We're a big fan of raised bed gardens. We've got several, and currently we're growing cucumbers, tomatoes. Peppers are great. Purslane. And so every now and then I'll find a, a cucumber. Nisha loves cucumbers. I don't, I hardly touch them anymore, but I'll find one that I've missed. That's gotten huge yeah. and is already, you know, turning yellow. I just take the thing and I go, tuk, 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 tuk. that's my call for the chickens. Yeah. I break the thing in half. I throw it yeah. on the ground and the chickens proceed to annihilate. That oh yeah. Cucumber. Yeah. And then they go lay me some eggs. And so whether yeah. you're, whether you're keto, ketovore, carnivore, it doesn't matter. You need to have a raised bed garden. Yeah, and Jack, he even he turbocharges it because his raised beds are hydroponic, so yeah. he doesn't even have to water his beds. It's all automatic at his place. So yeah, I'll do, and that's that's great thing. But let's let's hit something here. Like if you want easy crops, this is one of them. These Trumbachino zucchinis. You can't grow this. Maybe you need to start working on your your base skills. Um, another good crop, and it's good for people that want to keep. Tell the us the name load. of that squash again. Spell Trumbancino. I can't spell it. I'll get it to you. I can't later. spell that either. Trumbancino. No. Maybe if you yeah. roughly Trumbin Google Trumbin it, you can find it. Uh, but it's a it's a cucuberta mochetta is the uh, the clade of the uh, the Latinic name of the squash family, and all of those have those really thin, hard um, vines that the vine borers really can't get into. Butternuts are the same. Uh, as well. Uh, so those are easy. Butternuts are easy. All of those squash are easy for your winter squash or your summer squash. Uh, next is the uh, the Asian long beans, Asian yard long beans. They're almost no carbs if you pick them before the seeds form in them and they'll grow freaking 
30 inches long and they're about as big around as a number two pencil. We stir fry those all the time. If you have a water-based system, the Ipimera Aquatica, uh, Kang Kong, Chinese water spinach, call it what you want to. That is super easy. Radishes are super easy. And the way to do those, don't grow little cherry bell radishes because they suck. Grow the great big daikon radish. Yes. And let it go to seed to attract pollinators. Let it set seed pods. Pull those seed pods and saute those seed pods like you would little beans. Low carb, freaking delicious. And I don't like radishes. Right. I mean, but that I like. And then just leave that big root in the in the garden and it'll die and the worms will eat it. So yep. ask yourself, what would what would you pay somebody to come out to your property and everywhere you're growing every year, take a post hole digger and dig every foot a two foot deep hole and fill it up with worm castings? What's that worth? Well, if you plant those daikon radishes on a rotation out when you're not using that land that's exactly what happens you yes. cut the top off let the chickens process the top let the worms process the bottom and plant into that next year just you got to start thinking that way like don't think trophy hunter i want as much poundage as i can get out of here think how do i take care of this ground because yes. if you once we've moved up you're talking two acres once we move up to an acre an acre where you're where your butt out right yes. so once we moved up to an acre you got to start thinking i don't necessarily need to be getting something for me out of every square foot that I'm cultivating every year right. or every rotation. Maybe I'm growing spring here, fall here, and then next year falls resting here and spring's resting here. Yes. And I love, again, back to the layers. If you do that with the daikon radishes, they're excellent for, for helping the soil. And so when you feed the tops to the chickens, you're creating eggs or yep. chicken meat, and then you're letting the worms actually eat the radish. So you're going to have pounds of, of worm castings. So you're literally growing soil, not dirt, but soil that you can then grow future crops in. And then in a bind, you can actually eat the radish, God forbid, if you need to. So there's yep. all these layers where that's helping you become more, more self-sufficient and helping make your farm more productive. And you're you're literally on the couch while the radishes are growing. You're doing something else because, like Jack said, they're automated. The radish is going to grow. It's going to put out roots. It's going to make seed pods. And at any point, you can intervene and eat that or yep. feed that to some other livestock. Or you can literally do nothing. The chickens will eat the top off, and then the bottom will rot and feed the worms. And it's, it's that effortless kind of stuff, building that up in layer upon layer, where you've got literally millions of, of bacteria and nematodes and little, little insects and chickens and ducks and all you've got all these little workers working on your farm and you don't have to pay them. Some of the bigger ones you have to feed, but all the little ones feed themselves, but they're growing soil. They're making the soil more productive for future crops. Uh, it just it goes on and on. It's almost infinitely productive if you if you layer this and structure it properly. Correct. And then, like you mentioned, like it, hydroponics on the right turn, but I do use water based systems and terrestrial based systems together. So I have these big tubs. I mean, they're you could do the same thing with an IBC cut in half and flipped over, right? So there are these big fiberglass tubs that they used to feed cattle uh, molasses out of them, and I took those, put bulkheads in them so water can get in and out. And again, it's describing a wicking bed. Just go to my site, look up wicking beds. I've done full tutorials on them. But basically, again, you have water on the bottom, you have soil on the top, you have a layer in between of a weed blocker. And I usually do a layer of weed blocker, and then I do a couple inches of perlite and then the soil. So you get a good separation there. And instead of having to fill them up, what I'll do is I'll take one of my ponds, I'll run water in one side. It runs across the bottom, maintains a level in the bottom, keeps the soil always irrigated, and it overflows the other side. And you can set that to, you put a, a little pump in your pond. You set it to go off 15 minutes twice a day, and that will never need to ever be touched ever again. But once every two years, that little timer will crap out. They're eight bucks, throw it away, get a new one. And, and then that way, we're taking the pond water, which has full of life and full of oxygen for the fish. And we're giving it to the plant. And since we're not watering, this is what's awesome about it. If you're watering through the top of a, of a container and there's water coming out the bottom, well, nutrients coming out with it. If we're watering from the bottom, we might strip a little bit of nutrient off the bottom, but all that nutrient we keep adding to the top, it stays in the system. It doesn't get washed out. So now we're using 
sort of aquaponics and sort of container gardening. We're putting them together. And you know what we do in that water, right? Can we grow food? So instead of growing goldfish and koi, I go down a little park pond with my grandson. We take a few pieces of shrimp that we throw in some salt the night before so the fish can't steal it. And we catch a whole bunch of bullheads. We take those bullheads, we throw them in the pond. Once a year, we drain the pond down where it makes it easy. We harvest 100 bullheads that are about yay big. And I figured, like, I never used to really like them that much. I thought they tasted good, but they're so much work. I learned a method. You just go here on YouTube and search for it. You'll find a little old man with a pocket knife show you how to do it. It's called shucking bullheads. And you take that little tab on the back and you cut the top all the way up to the spiky part that'll poke you. You turn the knife over, you break the backbone, you crack the fish, you grab the backbone with a with a pair of pliers, and you pull. And in one hand, you have a skinned, bone-in, perfectly clean fish. The other hand, you have the head and the guts. Well, I do with the head and the guts is I'd have a big compost pile. I dig it all out because I don't want it to stink. I'm not feeding that to chickens. They won't eat it fast enough. I don't want the dogs to get it. I'll put it down deep in the compost pile, cover it up, and now I've got all that nutrient from those fish that's a long-term compost pile. Or maybe we're going to grow, we, I grow channel cats in some ponds instead of the bullheads. I grow bluegills in them. So every couple of weeks, you know, maybe you go out with a rod, you pull one of those fish out, or maybe you do a big harvest. It's up to you. So now we're growing fish, we're growing plants, but we have that whole surface area. So then I go, you know, maybe I grow some of that Kang Kong I talked about, but we can trail that out of the water. So we still have the surface. I don't want the water too warm. I want the water shaded. So I could put a big net over top of it. Well, that's money and work and doesn't do anything for me. Take a plant called water hyacinth, another one the government doesn't want you to grow. That's a great thing to how to figure out what to grow. Grow the things the government says not to grow because they all grow <laughs> really good. And I put that, put a couple pieces of water hyacinth. I take a couple of them every year when it goes to winter. I throw them in one of my fish tanks to overwinter it. A couple pieces out there in the spring once the frost is over and it grows like crazy. It has more protein per pound than freaking soybeans. And you know what eats it? Every single animal we eat eats it. Rabbits eat it. Chickens eat it. Gooses eat it. Ducks eat it. Ducks eat the roots. Ducks and geese eat the roots. Everything else just eats the tops. Cows eat it. Goats eat it. I mean, everything eats it. So we grow tons of that. I have a pond sitting, and, and I'm on three acres. So two acres, you could definitely do all this. I have a pond that's behind my chicken house, and chickens and the ducks can't get to that pond. I have a compost pit. And I have a rake and I take the, 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 uh, the, the water plants and I just throw them over the fence right into the compost pit. And I'm cutting my feed bill in half throughout from, from late spring to, to mid fall. I'm feeding half rations just with the plants out of one pond. It's eight by 16 foot and nice. it's only two foot deep. And that's an example of what can be done. And then that pond is running multiple wicking beds. It's running multiple ebb and flow beds. I don't even grow all that stuff. I grow mostly st stuff for the animals in it because I don't eat that much vegetation. But if you do, this is the way. And then get that on that pond. I have another tank that's upgrade. The ducks swim around in there and poop in it. I open a valve that goes into the pond and it feeds those plants. So I'm using their fertility to feed them with their own plants. And yes, I'm growing catfish in there too. Like, yeah. See and how that layers expensive shrimp. I'm growing those in tanks that drain back into that, and so it it's layer upon layer upon yep. layer, which gives gives Jack multiple options. At any point, he can intervene. He can have a small harvest, or he can he can drain it and have a huge harvest. And so there, it's just it's just option after option and layer after layer. And that's the kind of you start out very simple, but then if you if you have those concepts in mind as you grow. This stuff becomes almost effortless. There's always some work to do on a farm. Don't 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 mistake what I'm saying, but it becomes effortless to the point where you you've got so much productivity, but you're not doing that much work anymore because you used your head in the beginning. You automated everything you could. You tried to layer everything you could, and you've got it. So at any point, you can eat the veg, or you can feed the veg to the to the chickens, or the quail, or the goats, or the sheep, or the turkey. Or the ducks, you, you just got all these options and all these layers, which uh, really go. makes you very a very resilient person. Let's go there for a minute with the turkeys. Easiest meat I've ever raised in my life. They eat a lot of food, but didn't cost me anything. And I bought food. It just didn't cost me anything. So yeah. the broad-breasted bronze turkey in about a five to six-month throwout get enormous. 
what like you're not cooking one in the oven whole. Uh, my biggest Tom ever, the carcass weight was 54 pounds. And I it was so big, I de breasted it to boneless breast cutlass. One side, the big side breast cutlet was nine and a half pounds. Wow. That is a big bird. There's a guy down. I don't know if he'll take them anymore for me after he's had to do them so many times, but he does them for eight dollars a bird processing. I wow. ain't even processing for that. I'll I'll take those down there. You put three in a dog crate, two, take two men to pick it up and put it in the back of the truck. So what I did, I grew out one year, I grew out like 20 of them. And I just put out on my show that if you wanted turkey from me, I didn't want to do any work. You come here, I pick three of them, the rest of them, whoever gets here first gets to pick them. People on a reserve list. I sold turkey for four free range turkey, four dollars a pound, and like you're selling a cow where they the process like processed weight, a carcass weight. So people came here, took the turkey, either self processed or took it to my processor themselves, and then on an honor system paid me. I paid for all my feed, and I had seventy five pounds of meat. I'm not talking bones. I'm talking meat. Yeah. At the end of that, that was free. And it was the best turkey. I'm not even a big turkey guy. It was the best turkey I've ever eaten in my life. And I did almost no work. Like turkeys are stupid when they're baby poults. If they make it to six weeks, they're like Mack trucks. They're, they're, they, they're indestructible and uh, amazing, amazing, amazing Absolutely. animal. Uh, you you mentioned Nick Ferguson earlier. Nick actually came to the farm here, and we we got about two hours of video of him, us riding around on the gator, looking at different things I'm doing here on the farm. I've got a, a, a editor guy working on that now. I'm going to be posting that probably in the next two or three weeks. Uh, Nick Ferguson's a great resource, and I'm 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 honored to be able to share the all. I mean, literally when he opens his mouth knowledge and wisdom comes out yep. and for, to be such a young punk that's a quite a compliment to say about somebody right jack but i mean this guy knows his stuff oh he I does into jack he helped jack set up a lot of his uh permaculture and a lot of his um the the way that his land is structured and uh I, that's going to be up in a few weeks so if you haven't already subscribed to this channel subscribe now and turn on notifications. So when I post those Nick Ferguson videos, you'll have access to that. You'll get a notification. Any, I've, I've kept you long enough, Jack. I know you got stuff to do. I can tell you're getting antsy. Your ADHD. No, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Give us some, some final wisdom for somebody literally just starting like, okay, Dr. Barry and Jack Spearco, you convinced me here. What do I do first? How do I get started actually feeding myself? Yeah. Well, first let me say, we got a bunch of my people in here, a bunch of your people in here. A lot of my folks know you. You're on my expert council and they're subscribers to your, your main YouTube channel. Guys, if you're not on this channel that Ken has, get on the farm channel that he has, uh, OB Farms, and, and subscribe to that as well. Um, when it comes to deciding what to do first, I think you, you should evaluate what your assets are and what could work. Don't try to do everything at once. Just make a list of all the things Think about what you've heard tonight, other people you've listened to. All these things could work. But let's grow what you're going to use first. So I recommend this with gardening, but I also recommend it with food storage and all. Let's start out saying, like, people, I'm going to get food storage. I'm going to go buy rice and beans. Do you eat rice and beans? No, then don't do that. Right. Right. If you want to set up, like, once you've got everything else in order, you want to put a couple 15, 20 buckets of it up to feed refugees from your family that don't take care of themselves, that's fine. But look, when it comes to you, Store what you eat and grow what you eat. So get a little notepad or something like that or some paper off the printer even. Put it on the counter. For the next two weeks, write down every single thing that you eat. You might start eating better if you do this, but at, le at least you know what you eat. And then say, what in there can I grow for myself or can I grow something that re replaces it? So if you find out you eat a lot of chicken every week, and you can't have chickens. Well, quails replace chickens. If you realize, you know, I eat a meal of fish once every two weeks. Well, one pond, you know, and I'm not talking about a big, if you can put in a half acre pond, you're done. Throw a deer feeder with a with fish feed in it and you're go, you're golden, right? But I'm talking like one of my size ponds, like four or 5,000 gallons. You can take a couple fish out of there every couple of weeks and never run out of fish. Just keep adding. That's the beautiful thing. Once you have a pond, you go fishing, right? You catch a fish, it's legal, but little. You bring it home, put it in your pond, and you let it grow out, right? You, you save it on the fin instead of in the freezer. 
Yes. So figure out what will do the most for you first. I will tell you, if you're in a suburban area, find some good quality fruit trees for your climate. And, and the way to do that, don't listen to catalogs, trees, don't read catalogs and books. Find out what people grow commercially in your area and what varieties of it. Plant that because even if you don't eat fruit, you are increasing the value of your property. If somebody goes and looks at two different suburban houses, when you decide to move and get your bigger homestead and one has four or five apple trees in it and the other one has one big lollipop, some kind of ornament, they're going to buy that. So plant, plant fruit trees, vines, shrubs, perennials, and start, Start learning and learning slowly. And I just said, you know, don't trust the catalogs for what to grow, but read the catalogs. Some of the catalogs are the best information you get. Catalogs like Baker Creek, that one will, that one will hit you in the wallet because it's really, really well done. Uh, but things like Stark Brothers Nursery, Rain Tree Nursery, like that, get on their catalog list, start reading those, start learning about varieties. Look and see, like, I love to do permaculture, but I'm not a purist. I like to learn from people. So if there's a garden club in your area, Go there. If there's a master gardener program, they're going to put all kinds of fertilizer and stuff you don't want to use, but they still know how to grow food. Yes. So find people that are already doing it and, you know, look for meetups like that. And too, you might be surprised. There might be permaculture or gardening meetups. Go to them, just meet people, talk to people. If you were going to start a farm, I would tell you, once you found your piece of land, go find the oldest, crustiest, curmudgeon farmer that's like ready to quit, but he's still at it. Cause he knows everything that you're going to have, have happen to you. So you yep. can do the same thing with gardening. Go find that old lady at the end of the road that has beautiful tomatoes and all. I promise you, if you're like, can you show me how you do this? You're going to make her day. Yes. You're going to make her day. She's yes. waiting for somebody to act. You're not bothering her. If I'm in a, if I'm in a nursery or at like a box store where people are buying plants and I hear the person getting advice, it's terrible advice. I kind of like, I don't interrupt kind of hang out. And as soon as I go, like, hey, come here, let me tell you what to do. Or the guy's like, you know, I was good, got blind on my tomatoes. And I'm like, go go to the drugstore and buy a bottle of aspirin, throw an aspirin tablet in the hole when you plant a tomato. And, you know, put one aspirin tablet in a watering can and, and water the tomato with it every month. And you won't get blight anymore. And how do you know that? I, I learned that two years ago. Right. But once I have that information, I want to get and people that do this. They want to help you. They will help you. And if somebody's really good at growing something and you're not, but you're really good at growing something else, say, hey, why don't you grow tomatoes? I'll grow peppers. Right. And, and, and do exchange. We have to build economies absent entropy in our backyards right now before we have to. We need to do it so that we don't have to later. Because once we have to, it's going to be too late. And what I mean by that is all this money that we spend buying food that comes from Brazil or China or God knows where. That money leaves our economies. We have the ability. I'm not going to do rabbits, chickens, quail, like all uh, everything I could do. I'm not going to do all of it. I don't want to do all of it. I like free time. I'll do my ducks and my geese and my muscovy ducks and my fish. I would love it if my back neighbor would do rabbits. And I would totally trade the best duck eggs on planet Earth and a few duck carcasses for some rabbits every year. I would happily do that. And we need to start doing that everywhere. And everybody wants to make like a big community commune type thing. Every, don't grow where you are. Start growing your relationships, not just your backyards. Absolutely. I love that. And Jack's exactly right. When I was first getting started trying to be a rancher, uh, I, there, I knew there was a guy who lived about five miles up the road. He was a patient before the clinic fire. And he got tons of livestock. He knows he's been doing it for 50, 60 years, right? And I'm like, I need to go up there and ask him. I need to go up there. And finally, one day he was driving by and he saw me doing something really stupid out in the pasture. I don't even remember what it was. And so he just pulls in my driveway and he's like, hey, yeah. Doc, what are you doing? And I tell him, he said, yeah, but why are you doing that? <laughs> and so he actually came to me. But but I should have swallowed my pride about six months before that and went to him and said, hey, I'm trying to spray some animals. Do you? Can you help me with this? He, you, Jack's exactly right. That would have made his month if I had done that. But when he did come and offer some free advice, I happily took it and did everything but hug the guy because you know I'm a doctor. I'm not. I, I'm. You know that that doesn't make for a good farmer or a rancher typically because we tend to overthink things. But yes, please reach out and form community 
and find that little old lady or that little old gentleman who's been doing this for 50 years. I'm doing my work, boy. Come here and say hi to everybody. <laughs> this is my two and a half year old kindergartner. All right, Jack. Doing, listen, bud? Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, no this problem, will be available man. for replay if anybody wants to watch it. Get out of here. Go learn something. Thanks for doing this, Jack. I'm going to put the link also to your YouTube channel. You can, he's got a ton of great videos about how to do stuff on his YouTube channel. I've got the link to the podcast down below. Anything else you want me to share, Jack, so people can find you? Just just get over to the website, uh, and it's the survivalpodcast.com. If you don't want to type that many letters, I made it easy for you, tspc.co. And if you happen to be into the world of Bitcoin and crypto, I also have a, a thing I do called the Bitcoin Breakout production of the survival podcast that's at the bitcoinbreakout.com so i believe in, in in cultivating wealth and food and relationships all of it so come on by and learn more i think you'll enjoy it our community is pretty cool and ken barry's part of it ken barry is on my expert council guys if you you get on my podcast you'll hear ken about once a week usually on thursdays and occasionally on an interview so this is his yeah, chance yeah. he got to turn it I around love everything jack does he's he's a bit of a arrogant smart ass but i think yeah. that's part of the reason i like him uh <laughs> he knows his stuff he, he's a he's a he's a teacher but the best teacher is always a good student and that's what i love about jack is he's always learning he's always eager to learn and and i think all you guys need to be the same way thank you so much jack spearco for doing this i'll see you at your place next time you have an event november that's right. I'll be there in November. Thanks a lot, brother. See you guys later.